All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome back or welcome to the 2021 Fall Protection Stand Down. Again, I apologize for the technical issues that we experienced here this morning, but we got a great program for you, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get things kicked off. So the event's being brought to you today um, by Ritu Associates in partnership with the OSHA Area Harrisburg office. We have some great folks here with some great information. So you're going to have a panel available to you today. Uh, on that panel, you're gonna have Dale Glacken. He's a compliance specialist out of the OSHA area office. You have Kristen Morgret with Ritu. She's a senior safety professional here and a group manager handling industrial. You have Kelly Kramer, who's a senior safety specialist, group manager handling training. So each one of these folks has a great amount of wealth of knowledge. So please tap into that when we get to the question and answer session. And I'll talk to you about that in one second. Also joining us today is going to be Kevin Chambers. He's the OSHA area director, and he unfortunately was not able to be here live with us today due to a conflict, but it's extremely important to him, and he wanted to make sure that he got a message out to everybody. So we're going to see that in just a little bit. The other thing that we're going to have is we're going to have a giveaway here today, and you'll see there on the on the screen that we got a really beautiful uh harness and a lanyard. We also have five backpacks. The harness and lanyard is in a partnership between Ritu and Halen Hardy. So uh, six lucky winners will get uh, those gifts given away to them. The event is being brought to you from Ritu's Mechanicsburg office, which is in Mechanicsburg, PA, and all COVID related uh, protocols will be followed. That's why you'll see your panelists with face coverings on. And let's talk about the questions. So if you go to the top of your screen, you're going to see a Q&A bubble up there. If you just hit that, um, then you're going to be able to type in your questions. We're going to hold all questions um, until the very end and then we will get those questions out. And again, you have access to the whole panel. So uh, with that, we're going to get things kicked off. And the first thing we're going to hear from Kevin Chambers, OSHA Area Director. Good morning. My name is Kevin Chambers. I'm the Area Director for the Harrisburg Office of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. I'd like to welcome you to Fall Safety Stand Down Week 2021. During my tenure as a safety and health professional, I've learned one indisputable truth about fall hazards, that gravity always wins. Despite years of concerted efforts by the private and public sectors, workers are still experiencing grievous injuries due to falling from substantial heights. The methods and practices have long been in place to mitigate these hazards, but they're still not being universally implemented. The Occupational Safety and Health Act, which last week celebrated its 50th anniversary of becoming law, states that employers shall furnish to each of its employees employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm and they shall comply with the Occupational Safety and Health Acts that are promulgated pursuant to the Act. However, the counterpoint to the statute states that each employee shall comply with the Occupational Safety and Health Standards and all rules, regulations, and orders issued pursuant to this Act which are applicable to his own actions and conduct. For those reasons, Concerned professionals such as yourself are here today to learn and refine your fall protection skill sets. Many of us know people that have experienced severe fall injuries. I'm reminded of a situation where I intervened during an enforcement inspection where the president of a residential framing contractor did not believe in the necessity for proper fall protection. Beyond the simple moral imperative that one of his employees could be killed or significantly injured, he took me out lining the direct and indirect costs of a business experience such an event to get him to conceptually agree with my analysis of that hazard. I told the president of the company who was present on site that day that one fall injury would have a lasting effect on the well-being of his business. I moved beyond the medical response and insurance factors by explaining that they were going to be at risk of having their contract to build townhouses terminated. The work they had lined up for the long term was likely going to end due to the damaged image of the site developer. Sadly, it took a dollars and cents approach to stop him from ignoring his responsibilities under the law. This continues to be common amongst many smaller construction companies. However, I'm speaking to a group that understands these facts. There's no excuse for working at height without applying an appropriate type of fall rest, fall positioning, or fall restraint system. OSHA's Harrisburg Area Office is happy to be part of this event, and we're appreciative of the host for sharing their body of knowledge with you. Thank you for your kind attention. Now on to the learning. Again, big thank you to Kevin Chambers. Uh, he stresses the importance of this and how important it is to him uh, 
you know, on a professional and personal level. So next, we're going to turn it over to Dale Glacken. He's a compliance specialist out of the Harrisburg area office. If you've never reached out to Dale, I encourage you to do so. Extremely helpful, extremely knowledgeable. Dale, it's all yours. Good morning. I want to thank Ritu. Uh, this is our fourth event with Ritu, our fourth stand down. So thank you very much for your interest in safety and health and for having us out here today. And this is actually OSHA's eighth fall protection or prevention stand down. So uh, thank you for being part of this. I'm not going to hit everything. We're going to hit a lot of topics. And if you want to do some follow up with me, by all means, please do. That's what I'm there for. So what I want to do with you today is hit some a little bit of an update with what's going on within the agency, some statistics and some things to think about. But I'm hoping you can take what you get today and use some of this information or all of it in your own fall prevention stand downs with your workforce to help make a difference there. And we're also going to talk about what is the best solution. So let's just jump into this. Uh, we've had some changes within uh, the Department of Labor. We have a new head, Mr. Martin Walsh. So he's the new head of the Department of Labor. And for OSHA, we have a new head as well. And that's Mr. James Frederick. He's the new head of OSHA. That's also known as a, uh, the position of Assistant Secretary for Occupational Safety and Health. So that's under the Department of Labor. And with him, he brings his staff of talented safety folks. And then for Region 3, Mr. Rivera is the head of Region 3. So let's look at injuries and illnesses as a whole. Uh, as we know, when OSHA first started, we were looking at around 14,000 fatalities a year with half the workforce, half the employers. And since then, we've had a great strides. So if somebody asks, does the safety thing work? Yes, it does. It, it shows in these numbers. And what I would like to also point out is the rate for 100,000 workers dying on the job has dropped to 3.5. At the beginning, we were close to 10. We're now down to 3.5. Great strides have been made by industry, by workers, by labor, and of course, uh, OSHA. So let's take a look at construction real quick. We see in 2018, we had ten, uh, a little over 1,000 fatalities in construction. For 2019, which is our latest data, we have 1061. So the number has gone up. That's a concern for us. What else do we see? Let's take a look at the rates. The rates for these fatalities um, are, are about 9.5 to 9.7. That's almost three times what general industry would be. And that is why OSHA has such a concern and a focus on construction because we're trying to get ahead of these fatality numbers, trying to lower those. So here's the top five areas where OSHA sees fatalities. Transportation accounts for about two fifths of our fatalities. A lot's been done by transportation and by the state of Pennsylvania, but more can always be done there. But we're here today to talk about falls and we see as a whole, we had 880 fall uh, slips and trip fatalities across the board. And we've trended these and we can see that uh, they did go down in 2018, but back up in 2019. So that's a concern for us. And then what you'll see in the lower chart is how we're doing with construction. There's 418 in construction alone. So let's look at some numbers together. When we look at the number of falls, 880 over the number of fatalities as a whole, we see about one sixth of our fatalities were fall related. When we look at the construction side and we look at the whole, it's about 7.8 or about 12, one twelfth the number of fatalities and when we get over to take a look at the number of construction fatalities to the total for construction, it's about 39%. So, so that's why it's such a great focus for OSHA because it accounts for over one third of our fatalities in construction. And that is why we encourage people to have a fall prevention campaign. What we can see here is what our numbers look like. Falls are definitely the first, the, the highest producer, followed by struck by, electrocutions, and caught in between which is typically uh, associated with, with trenching fatalities. So we're trying to get ahead of these. CPWR has worked with the Bureau of Labor Statistics in OSHA, and what they have come up with is that 146 of those 2019 fatalities 
were from roofs, 93 were from ladders, and 52 were from scaffolds. So uh, definitely look at other areas where we could fall and have fatalities as well. For the general industry folks, when we look at their top 10 list of fatalities, uh, I'm sorry, citations, where they see their citations, only one involves fall protection. And this paragraph deals with folks working in, in areas uh, where you need to have protection at four feet. Housekeeping was an issue with some of these, uh, some of these citations. Protruding objects, loose boards, um, um, snow and ice, and the need to inspect work surfaces were actually the causes for these. Let's take, and also with uh, platforms, people working off of aerial lifts. The big things we see there is people not wearing their harnesses. They're not attached. They might have a harness on, but they're not attached to the lift, and they don't have their feet firmly on the floor. For construction, quite a few of these items actually citations related to falls. And um, we actually see there's a total of six of them. Scaffolds is the first one on the list. And once again, making sure people wear the right equipment when they're in that basket, uh, that they have their fall protection of some sort, guardrails or whatever, at the 10 foot level. And then of course, um, each work surface where people are working needs to be fully planked. And then training for those folks needs to be done by a qualified person qualified person. Fall protection as a whole, this is the, the biggie, and you can see that number, almost uh, 3,500 uh, citations just for residential construction. Training requirements, and what I often find if you don't have your other programs in place, the training is bad too. How do you train if you haven't laid out your expectations and you haven't gone over them with your workers? And a lot of times the reason companies haven't done that is because they don't have some of the other controls in place. So training, that's a big one. Over a thousand citations there. Uh, fall protection, unprotected sides and edges. Um, do you have the proper protection to keep, keep people from falling from the edges? Um, do you have maybe a, uh, a warning line, not a warning line, but a, a guardrail system up with a mid rail and a tow board? Are, are those things taken care of? Roofing work on very low slope roofs that's less than uh, 412 and less. Uh, do you have the proper controls in place for those? And then, of course, a record to show that you've actually given that training to, to your workers so that they understand it. And, of course, anytime somebody doesn't get it right, you should be doing follow-on training with them to make sure that they have that competency. Still erection, we, we still see citations out there in this particular area. Remember, at 15 feet, you have to do something unless you're a connector, but at 15 feet, you have to do something for your worker to protect them from falling to that lower level, two stories or 15 feet. Um, training as well as perimeter cables and um, fall protection that's used in the steel erection industry needs to fall on, uh, follow the rules for, for uh, fall protection as a whole. Demolition, there's only one section that really covers falls and that's making sure openings are covered so if you have any uh, openings where you're dropping material through that they're covered. Ladders, as I mentioned earlier, ladders account for 93, accounted for 93 of the, 100, uh, the 2019 fatalities. So they're important. Make sure that they extend three feet above the upper surface, that they're being used appropriately, that you don't have a, a step ladder that you're using um, as, a, um, uh, as an extension ladder or whatever. It, it cannot be leaned against the wall unless it's designed for that purpose. It needs to be opened up. And not using the top step as a step, I can't tell you how many times I've gone out onto a construction site and found people standing on the top step. Not a good place to be. And they also need to have uh, ladder and stairway training. And you'd be surprised people don't realize that that's a requirement as well, but it's in there. They have to have that. And then, of course, anytime you have a break in elevation of 19 inches, uh, now you need to have some way to, to account for that, either through a stair or a, or a ladder. So what's your ways to protect people? One is to stop the fall altogether uh, from the front end. Many options there. Or after someone falls, you have to er catch them, either in a personal fall rest system or a safety net. And what I will say about these options, the minute you decide to arrest somebody, 
you've already admitted to the fact that somebody can fall and somebody can get hurt. And that means you need to have some means of rescuing them at that point. So what are your options? You can put a cover over a hole. You can put a guardrail up around the perimeter to protect people. You can use restraint. That's a great option. A lot of people don't realize that's available to them, but that keeps them from falling in the first place. Next, warning lines. Uh, warning lines are good for certain operations, particularly um, roofing. Uh, if you use it for anything other than roofing, that can be a problem, but we don't want to see that. Control access zones for the areas where you're working, control decking zones for a steel erection, and then safety monitoring systems would only be for, for the, um, the roofing work. So if you're going to use any of these lower ones, make sure you call us. We'll go through what you can and can't use for those. And then arresting the fall whether it be with a personal fall arrest system. And I can't stress enough the word system there. A lot of people forget this is a system. All the pieces have to be in place. If you're missing one part, it doesn't count. It's a system. All parts have to be accountable for, accounted for. And then safety nets. OSHA's put out several resources as well as CPWR and NIOSH to help you be successful with this fall stand down. Uh, we have fact sheets. NIOSH has put out infographics, OSHA has pamphlets, OSHA has put out videos on YouTube, and the Ladder Safety Institute each year hosts Ladder Safety Month, which is March, and uh, that's always a good opportunity to get it right with, with fall protection with ladders. So some of those resources are there. Okay, here's my recipe. I want to help you get it right. First, as, uh, consider what your fall hazards are. You do that assessment, walk around your job site, see what you have, see where your problems are, make sure you're getting it right. Plan out your job, look at the job, figure out the best means to do it. There's no one option that's available for all hazards. You, it depends on your capabilities, what you can do, what you can't do, uh, what your folks are trained to do. Um, there's no one solution to this. What works for one company may not for the next. So plan it out based on what you have in your own workshop in your in your own um, company to make it successful but plan it out plan out what is the best option for each job then provide the equipment that's needed follow that up with going over your expectations with your with your workers let them know how you want a particular job done what you would like to see and then always make sure you're inspecting everything on the work site your equipment the work area, which as we know in construction, it constantly changes. Things don't stay the same. So make sure you're keeping after your work area and make sure that the workers are following your plan then too. You can have a great plan, but if nobody's enforcing it, it's going nowhere. So that's part of your uh, inspection requirements. And then go back, reevaluate, look for ways to improve. Uh, just because it worked last time, maybe there's opportunities in the future to get it right. So do participate in the stand down this week. A lot of good opportunities out there. Uh, make sure you're doing this for your workers. A lot of good resources and events. Uh, and when you're done with your stand down, apply for a certificate of participation from OSHA. We'll send that to you. Say you have 10 job sites, uh, save that as a PDF file, print it out, put it in your trailer, you know, certificate of participation. Good thing to have. And then we have some other highlights and information with this as well. And another opportunity is later today is a virtual stand down with the head of OSHA, NIOSH, and CPWR. So that'll be a good opportunity for you to participate in as well. And then locally, this is what Pennsylvania looks like for area offices. There are six of them. We have a new area director on the chart, and that's Mary Reynolds. She's now in the Wilkes-Barre area. And that's all I had. Excellent. Thank you, Dale, for that information. Very good, uh, very useful. I do want to just uh, circle back on that and um, reemphasize that uh, one slide for success because I think that's very important. And that was one, to assess, two, plan, uh, three, provide the necessary equipment, make sure people know what the expectation is through training, and then go ahead and uh, evaluate and follow up and maintain that plan and then improve on those things that you discover. So. Excellent piece, and that will be shared with everybody if they want to uh, try to implement that. Uh, welcome, thank you. I'm uh, Kelly Kramer, and uh, I just have two videos I want to share with you. They're both pretty brief. The first one is about a six-minute video on just some basic fall protections, uh, fall protection system requirements. 
Uh, so without any delay, we're going to uh, go ahead and watch that video. Good morning. I'm Kelly Kramer from Two Safety. Thank you for taking the time for your busy schedule and joining us today. Hopefully the time is valuable. We want to go over uh, some common things that we see uh, in the field from our experience. First, most importantly is the reasoning why. Last year, all protection is the number one citation uh, for the ocean. But even more important than this, there was nearly 803 families from falls, which is just completely unacceptable. So we want to make sure we can avoid those citations for you and then come up with solutions so that you don't uh, have any issues with your employees. Uh, so the only way we remember that, I want to help us remember that, is our basis of the ABC. Use the full section. A is our anchor. Uh, B would be our, our body harnesses. And then C would be our connectors. So I'm going to briefly go over an example or two of each of those. Uh, there are literally uh, probably thousands of different options. So it's really important to assess what you do, what will work best for you. Get input from your field personnel. Uh, they know what works best, what's comfortable, what fits best. So, so it's imperative to get their buy-in, and get their support, and see what they think. Uh, I'm going to start here with uh, Anchorage. Uh, the most common anchor that we see is uh, that we find useful is the uh, cross arm strap. So this is an example of a roughly six foot cross arm strap. Uh, you can see it's just a simple webbing. It's 5,000 pound rated, which is uh, the key for our anchors. Um, it does it does fit within itself. Uh, there's a couple different styles of that. This would go over uh, like a column or a beam, something structural overhead that's going to give you that 5,000 pounds. A nice thing here, these are, uh, they do uh, nest there, so you can go inside that and shorten that up as, uh, by wrapping that as many times as you need to to uh, achieve the appropriate anchor height for you. Another common one that we see is probably a beam clamp. Uh, so this one would go again, go over the flange of an overhead beam if you had that uh, access to that. Uh, is able to move around or slide and, and also adjust. So it's quick, quick and easy to adjust the anchor right in there. It's a nice overhead, overhead anchor. Uh, the, uh, this particular one is a reusable concrete anchor. Uh, I believe this one's two-person rated. has some very specific in installation instructions. It would be important to read those and follow those. But that one is designed to be used horizontally or vertically for up to two people. And it's nice when you're done, you can remove that and then uh, grout that hole and move on. So those are just some examples of anchors. There's, there's many other options, but uh, Moving on to our B or our body arms. Uh, if you were to go back to uh, uh, maybe when I was a little bit younger and, and harnesses were just becoming common, uh, this is a, a late 80s, early 90s vintage. Uh, very basic, very, uh, if you fell, it would be extremely uncomfortable, more so than the current uh, uh, versions that are out there now. Uh, but it, it served its purpose back in its time. Um, one thing we found with harnesses, if they're the more comfortable they are and the easier they are to adjust, um, the more likely somebody is to wear them. Number one citation last year was just lack of use, people not wearing them, not using them. So a big piece of that is making that system as comfortable as possible. Uh, so with that, there's, uh, I'll just give two examples here. Uh, this particular one's got some uh, mesh webbing in if it's hot out there where you're working uh, in the summer or down south. Uh, allows you to breathe a little bit. It's also non-conductive, so if you were an electrical trade, uh, you wouldn't have to worry as much about arc flash or shock. Uh, lots and lots of adjustments, uh, full body harness, uh, but, but really nice system. Uh, that in particular is made by Petzl. Uh, another one, Miller Revolution, makes a really nice harness, lots of padding. Um, got a body belt in here, that body belt can be removed or purchased without it, and then you can fit tools and different uh, attachments on there as well. Uh, the one nice thing I like about these, and this is the harness that I've worn for, uh, not this one, but this style in the past, I like the uh, tongue and buckle uh, leg straps, They're easy to adjust. Also the body uh, parts, those are easier to adjust, the more likely people are to do that. Now, one thing I should say about all this equipment, it has to be inspected daily prior to use. So you got to maintain it, it's very important to keep up with it. Uh, some of it takes some pretty good abuse, and pretty good wear and tear. So prior to use must be inspected by a competent person. And then uh, ANSI uh, recommends at least a once a year inspection by somebody other than the user. So 
different set of eyes looking at it and seeing if it's uh, getting some excess wear that needs to be taken out of the surface. Moving on to our last table, which is uh, C, our connectors. Again, a multitude of choices. Uh, probably the most common uh, connector of lanyard would be a straightforward single leg um, lanyard. All the, uh, all the connectors must be dual action, so self-closing, self-locking, and take two actions to open and close the or open it. A six-foot lanyard, you'll see later when we do the full um, demo, um, what that looks like when you fall six feet. Uh, but that one, so straight single leg. Many places are requiring 100 percent tile. Uh, so what that means is uh, you might need to go to a um, self-retractable lanyard or a double lanyard. Uh, so here's here's a uh, shock absorbing lanyard like we just showed you, but with two uh, two legs on that. That enables you to have your tie off to your dorsal D-ring and then attach to your anchor when you're not in use. That can go to um, to your uh, body harness uh, to a safe spot and then you can transfer with this particular one. Uh, these snap hooks are also nice for getting over larger um, larger anchorage. If you don't have six feet of free fall, one of the common mistakes people make is they don't uh, account for the fall distance. Uh, so self-retractable lanyards are nice. This is a double leg self-retractable with the larger snap hooks. So uh, one thing you can see about these is they'll grab very quickly. Uh, that will only allow you to fall, free fall, about two feet or less, uh, which is much less impact on your body. Obviously, less chance at the ground. So uh, overall, in my opinion, a safer system and a, a system that should be assessed when you're considering what you use. Uh, we'll move on uh, to the last part of our ABC. Um, one that people don't think, and we're going to add one more piece to that, the, the D, so A, B, C, D. And that would be the descent. Uh, so I'm going to show a, uh, a rescue, and also we're going to demonstrate two uh, falls to show the importance of uh, calculating the fall distance, one of the common mistakes people make. We'll go on to that point, and uh, thank you for your time. Good morning. So hopefully you found some value in that video of the ABCs of fall protection. Um, as it's stated in, the, in, in that piece, that our second video then is a uh, demonstration of falls that we've done in our, uh, our hands-on training center here at Ritu in Mechanicsburg. And it just illustrates the differences with uh, a couple different systems and then also how to, uh, how to effectively rescue somebody. the impact on our 155 pound uh, victim. Uh, what I want to do is just go over a couple of measurements here where he landed uh, and what that means. The, uh, the lander uh, went from six feet long with a what we call Dynapack or shock absorber. That elongated two additional feet. So we have eight feet of, of uh, connector between the anchor and the, and the victim's back or the dummy's back. Uh, his feet, he's about five feet tall. It's not Maybe 100% true to size dummy, but uh, 150 pounds, about five feet tall. His feet ended up uh, four feet from the ground. Our anchor was at 17 feet. So you can see the uh, the importance of getting adequate clearance. Uh, manufacturers recommend about 18 and a half feet typically for a six foot lanyard, and you can see why. Uh, even with not a full deployment of that uh, uh, the uh, lanyard, he was still pretty close to hitting the ground. But plenty of clearance here, given our 17 feet to anchor the ground. So we're going to go ahead and do a second demonstration uh, utilizing a self-retractable lanyard and just show the difference in, in uh, how far he would be from the, from the ground with that system. On this demonstration, we'll have a uh, this 
the same working height, our anchor is going to be at 17 feet. Uh, the one difference will be we'll use a self-retractable, uh, so that will uh, hopefully catch him a little sooner. So we'll let him fall and see where he lands. So you should have been able to see the difference between our two systems. Um, the, the end result, we uh, the, the person, the victim, uh, ended up about four feet less from the bottom. So at eight feet is where his feet are now. Uh, same anchor point as before, just use a different system, a self-retractable lanyard, let him free fall about two, two and a half feet total, and uh, much more clearance to the ground. So if you didn't have that uh, 18 and a half feet, you could go with that type of system. Uh, the last thing uh, as far as the demonstration is um, we have the one common mistake that other that people do make is they don't always consider how they're going to uh, get somebody down if they fell uh, or so of our ABC the D or descent. Um, OSHA says you have to be able to get somebody down uh, promptly in the event of um, if they can't self-rescue. If you've ever tried to self-rescue that's that's near impossible unless you can get inside of a window or a ladder or something. So we'll have to come up with a plan to get them down. You know, you may be able to use um, a ladder, a, a scissors lift, a crane basket, um, you know, roll, other rolling stairs. If you don't have anything like that, they do make, all the manufacturers now make some type of uh, lowering or descent device. So I would do want to do a brief demonstration on how, to, how that works and what that looks like. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. So we have a uh, controlled descent device that I'm going to go ahead and set up and demonstrate how that works. So you'd have to think the process through a little bit so that you would have an adequate anchor and then get into your uh, fallen person. This one has a, a uh, mechanical advantage for raising the person up. It's a little bit slow, but it certainly uh, it's a five to one mechanical advantage, so it makes it much easier to lift the person. So we'll lift him up off of his existing system. At this point, you can cut that system, or if you can reach him, you can remove that system. The existing ball arrest. And now I'm going to put him into a, a belay method and go ahead and do a control lowering, a control descent. Of this of the person. Typically, at about 15 to 30 minutes of uh, time with orthostat orthostatic intolerance or pulling the blood in the legs, so you want to get them, that person off of their uh, off of their harness uh, pretty much as quickly as you can, so that it reduces the chances for those types of effects. At this point, you can get him down. Uh, have ground personnel help you out, 911, whatever is necessary. He did take a fall, so he'd have to be evaluated by medical professionals. But certainly got him off the system in a reasonable time. Uh, that's the end of our, our, uh, our piece on the ABCs and uh, what it looks like for fall distance and how to rescue somebody. So our ABC and D. On behalf of Ritu, on behalf of OSHA, I want to say thank you very much for taking your time. Um, have a safe day. If you ever need anything, feel free to give us a call. I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Hopefully those videos were valuable. Um, as Dale had mentioned, we always want to uh, avoid that fall, obviously. And um, really, the, the personal fall arrest system should be our last resort. We do want to try to avoid that fall and that, and that exposure altogether, if possible, and then engineer that away when we can. Uh, so obviously always following the uh, the hierarchy of controls. Uh, so I think that's the, the end of our um, uh, formal uh, discussion.
uh, turning it over to uh, Paul and, and begin our uh, question and answer panel discussion. Excellent. Thanks, Kelly. If you could just uh, turn that off for the time being, that'll be great. Kelly, Dale, thank you. Now we're going to also open up and include Kristen. So now's the time of the presentation to start to fire your questions in. Use the Q&A section over there and we'll get that question out to the panel. So if anybody has a question, please type them in and we'll get them out and get them answered for you. All right, looks like the questions are starting to come in. And the first question that we have is, and it is from a Nick Yamana. And the question is, do I need fall protection on a scaffold? Do you want to take that, Dale? Well, there's three types of scaffolds, suspended, supported, and aerial. And there are requirements for you to have fall protection, and it would vary with what you're working with. Um, so pretty much the guardrail system is what we typically see on, and I'm, I'm thinking that you're thinking of a um, supported scaffold, meaning one that's, one that's built from the bottom up versus one that's hanging from above. But we typically look for our guardrail system on those, uh, but there are allowances in the standard for, for other options in using uh, personal fall rest systems as well. And this can be a challenge sometimes when you're erecting and dismantling a scaffold because there's no place to tie off. Um, but usually after a structure has been built, uh, which is pretty much why the scaffold was put there to, to, to help, say, lay a block wall and, and put the trusses overhead and everything, once there's a place to tie off, then you really should you should um, be tied off to when you're, you're doing your uh, dismantling process. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I could, I could, Paul, if I could just add one small thing to that. Um, many of the manufacturers also have some stipulations and, and if you do tie off to the scaffolding itself of what has to be in place in order to do that. Uh, so I know, for example, Bill Jacks has some specifics in, in what, uh, you know, which, which cross braces and which styles can, can, that can be done with. So I just want to add that little extra piece in there. It's good. Great. Thanks, Kelly. The next question that I have is coming in from Ron Harris and Ron wants to know, do I need fall protection while climbing a ladder? No, you do not. It's if it's a portable ladder, but uh, for the general industry folks, there were some changes made to the walking and working standard. And if it's a ladder that's over tw uh, 24 feet or higher, you need some type of a fall protection uh, system or a ladder safety system in those cases. So that's a fixed ladder for general industry, uh, 24 feet and more. Uh, portable ladders, no. All right, great. Next question came in from uh, Anonymous. I'm looking to go beyond fall arrest to fall restraint. What products are available? So, uh, Kristen can speak to this, but um, there's a there's a variety of products that are available. But what is key is going to be the installation and the use. So the the key for that is is installing it in a manner that is not going to allow you the potential for the fall. So to get to the leading edge or where the fall may occur. Um, but there's there's just like with all fall protection products and fall restraint, there's there's a, a wide variety um, and the, the use is going to be the key to, to aid in that decision to have the, the proper setup and installation as a part of that. But you can you can consult with your local area office. Uh, any manufacturers can give guidance and they have installation parameters and requirements manufacturers recommendations and requirements for those those install there's, there's a lot of information that's out there and if i may add uh, the new walking and working standard does have information on how to uh, what, what osha is looking for for a restraint system yeah they have less of a, an anchorage strength requirement on yes. those 
Excellent. Next question is coming in from an Elizabeth Miller. If my company performs general industry type work, but I work on a construction site, which rule applies to me, the four foot or six foot rule? I think Dale's going to answer that one. I can see the look in his eyes there. Uh, we look at what type of work you're doing, not, not what your industry is. Uh, so in that particular case, if you're on a construction site and you're doing construction type work, uh, then you would need to follow the construction rules. That's laid out in the beginning of uh, 1910 uh, where it defines that. We look at the type of work. Excellent. All right, next question coming in from Arthur Dietrich. And Art wants to know, how do I identify or qualify an acceptable anchor point if there's not one available by design? To identify what is going to be acceptable, your best practice with that is going to be consulting a structural engineer so they can verify either through the construction materials measurements or if there are as built drawings that where you would like to tie off to or secure to or use as your your base for your anchor would be able to withstand the potential loads that would be imposed if there were to be a fall i'm gonna i'm gonna add to that um anti z359 um which is a um not a, a requirement, but a uh, best practice, has a, a clear definition of qualified, uh, which is what Kristen just uh, stated there, uh, anchorage points, which are basically certified, we might know them as, versus a non-qualified uh, anchor point. And the definition they use in Z359 is of um, unquestionable strength as determined by a competent person. So, you know, you go to a building and there's a an overhead beam that uh, there's no way that if uh, Dale fell with that uh, and he was attached to a beam clamp, which is already rated, is certified, uh, that he's going to hit the ground as long as his system is, is per properly worn. That would be an example of a non-qualified anchor point and a competent person could make that determination without a certification. So. Great, thank you all. Next question comes in from Alice, and she would like for you all to speak to the importance of trauma straps and proper placement for aftermarket straps. So I'll, I'll take that one again. That is going to be indicated by the manufacturer. So again, you'll want to make sure that you, you read and, and heed all of the, the manufacturer's installation instructions as to where it should be placed on the harness and if they have specifics as to which harness it may be used with. And then also, just like any other fall protection equipment, you want to make sure that the person is trained in the proper use and that, especially in the, the case of those suspension relief devices, some of them have adjustments, so they would want to be adjusted to the individual that may have the need to use them. So myself, I am four foot 11. Uh, something that would be adjusted would be very different from me versus Kelly, who's over six feet tall, uh, to use a, a set of straps that, that are adjustable. So again, the key is to, to be able to relieve the pressure that is, is placed on the femoral arteries from the fall and the what the harness actually doing its job. I'm, I'm going to add something to that as well. The um, just like Kristen said with the training, very, very important, but also to uh, try some different types. Um, almost every manufacturer has them and they are uh, they they vary greatly from one to another. Some are, in my opinion, extremely easy to use. Some are a little bit more challenging. And you would not want to be uh, deploying that device and seeing that or using that for the first time uh, after a fall. Uh, so, so try or, or look at a couple different manufacturers and see what you think is the best and works the best and is the easiest to use. Excellent. The next question we have is comes in from Anonymous. It says, 
On a low slope roof, does a warning line system provide adequate protection for construction activities? I believe Dale is an expert on this. Well, the, the, for construction on a low slope, um, it, it, a warning line is fine for roofers. It has to be six feet back if they're working on that roof. If they have mechanical equipment and they're going back and forth, then it goes to six feet where that warning line, if they're parallel, and it's 10 feet if you're perpendicular. Now, if you're another trade, you cannot use the six foot. Now it backs off to about, um, 15 feet. And so you, if you're within that 15 feet, now you need to have either a, a safety net or first uh, personal fall rest system or travel restraint system, something in that extra zone. But um, anybody beyond that could then, beyond the 15 feet, would be protected. All right. And we only have one Last question, if anybody has any other questions, please get them in. The last question I have in the queue is from Phil Fish. And Phil's question is, when no suitable anchor point is overhead, um, an example like a working on top of an HVAC unit, can I complete a fall hazard assessment identifying the hazards and safe work procedures and not need a personal fall arrest system uh, or fall protection devices? That was a lot, if you want me to read that again. It, I'll say it sounds based on what the answers of that assessment would trigger if you need to have fall protection or fall restraint. So if you have an exposure to a fall, or a hazard that presents the potential for injury, then you you must protect the employee from that hazard. So the, the I'll say the statement had a lot of parameters. The answer would also have a lot of parameters. So you, you need to identify what the, the level of hazard is, and you're gonna need to protect the employee correctly to the hazard that's identified. So if you can you must either protect or prevent the fall from occurring. So again, that's going to depend on the size, the placement of the HVAC unit, um, and, and those type of things. The how they're accessing it. If they're if they're using a ladder, and the HVAC unit is in the middle of the roof, and it's within you know a guardrail system. On the ex, you know, the, the outermost points of the roof, then you may not need additional fall protection. If the HVAC unit is at the very edge of the roof and they have exposure to a 30 foot fall, then yes, we must do something to prevent that employee from falling. But there's